whatever the team needs to do, I fully support. And, and if it does end up happening, I hope they get it. You know, I hope there's a kid, even if it's a player to be named later, he's a low A kid. And then in three years, he's a stud. And I'd be like, I helped with that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I'd love that. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode number 201 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media. And this guy actually hit lead off for us way back when we started this show. He is back for another turn. This is the second time in a week I get to see you. What a, wow. what a pleasant, pleasant surprise for me. Lucky you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, actually, there we go. There's a picture of the first time we ever met in person. You're, you're the last person of the Rose, Rose Rotation I got to give a full, firm hug to. So I feel complete. It's it's you finally met all your kids. Um, though I am jealous that I didn't get to like lay across on my own like hotel bed like you did with class now. But you know, it is what it is. Hey, dare to dream. You know, let's not. There's you know, still a lot of time relationship. Left. You don't want to start your in-person relationship that high because really, Glass now and I have nowhere to go but down after that. So yeah, you and I can continue can to build. build stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I want to thank you. Uh, this was the All-Star Watch Party that we had, so there were a lot of baseball fans there, and some of whom swarmed toward Trevor May, and we had to beat them off with a stick. So thank you. No, it was it was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun, actually. I I like I believe it or not. I like talking about baseball quite a bit and getting into the nuts and bolts, especially when I haven't, when I can't really like go in depth analysis about other teams like that usually. So it was kind of cool. Yeah. And by the Good way, practice. your feet are enormous. What size are they? 15s. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you can't go into a store and buy shoes, right? No, I never have never, never been able to do that. No, it's all online. I don't think I've purchased sh shoes in a store since like, 2004. Mm -hmm. Wow. So. 2004. Yeah. So, so, like... uh, no, I, my, my shoe size grew with me until I was 16. So I went like 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I had 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s, 15s, 16s. And then we stopped at 16 because we always like went a little bit big because I was going to grow into them. Right. And then about my third year pro ball, I was like, I don't think I wear 16s. I don't, I think these are a little too big. I'm double them socks. So let's go to 15s. And I actually, scientifically, I'm like a 15 and a quarter. So it's like most 15s fit me. Some don't. I have to go 16 every once in a while. But yeah, that's how it works. So like once it hit 15, actually once it hit 16, because they don't have 16s anywhere. That's when I just gave yeah. up. Yeah. One of my, uh, one of my sons is a size 15. So I know the pain of trying to purchase shoes. I think Brault was the one that told us that he forgot his cleats one day, maybe in the minors or something. I imagine if that happens to you, you're really fun. Yeah, I'm screwed. Uh, we, But then again, I usually have a teammate that has also, fit, like, there's usually a couple guys that are bigger than me. But unfortunately, what I found in the past is, like, those guys always have, like, normal size for you. For like, a 6'7 guy's got, like, 13. So, I'm like, the fact that I have bigger feet than you makes me mad. Okay. Who's the who's the largest teammate you ever played with? Largest teammate I ever played with. Um I played with uh a couple six eight guys. Uh one guy in the minors hmm. named uh, Mike Bolsonbrook, who was uh Dutch, so of course he was six eight, but uh probably Batonsis. Batonsis overall, just like you know, being yeah. six eight, and he's like proportionate. Or uh, there's a guy with the Mets who I believe he just got Tommy John. His name's Bryce uh, Montes de Oca. He is a absolute monster of a human. Um, from far away, you're like, ah, oh, he's like six two. You get close, he's like six eight, and just like looks like a athlete. And he also throws like 102, so I guess that makes sense. Batansis is a sweetheart too. I always liked him. He is. Dylan's like I was. I really like Dylan. He was always, especially when he was hurt, he was working through a lot of stuff um, in his last year with, there with the Mets. And he was always down, hanging out in the bullpen with us, like during the games. Like he didn't have to do any of that stuff because he was he was shelved pretty solidly. Like he was. It wasn't there wasn't really a light in the, the the end of the tunnel for him, and he was still just around us, like watching all the games, knew how we were doing. Like that's that's he's a great teammate. I really like Dylan. 
Well, you can thank the Yankees for uh, ruining that guy's career. They only threw him about five times a week when he was doing his best. I, I didn't. I forgot. Someone brought this up the other day that he struck out 100 guys four straight years. That's absolutely unheard of for relievers. Even the best ones, like, because when Lidge had that run, I don't know if he did it four years in a row. That's amazing. That's crazy. Pretty dang good. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover with you. It's been a while since we've we've caught up with you. Um, let's start with the wildness that is the Oakland A's and the fact that you are kind of like the children in a divorce right now. How challenging. <laughs> that is a, that's a great analogy. That's exactly what it is. Well, right? I mean, how difficult is it? I know that you're a professional and that you guys kind of band together. But isn't it weird going to the stadium where you're like, oh, my God, they're going to be leaving this place and they're trying to figure out how to get to Las Vegas. And it's weird is probably the best word. It's weird. Um, but like as you hear from from guys all the time, like about the trade, like when things are looming, we're like at least we have a lot of practice in trying to like stay day to day just because it's every day. Like projecting forward is very hard, not hard not to do as just a human, but like if anyone has practice and like fighting against that, it's a baseball player. So, I mean, I, I do feel for the guys who are like very early in their career and looking to like establish themselves in the big leagues. And like, you know, I, I know that like any, like the amount of stability they're going to be able to have when they're even not at the field, is going to be is up in the air. And that would, I know that would, that would stick in my teeth quite a bit, but like um, it's one of those things like, you know, I'm I'm definitely closer to the end than the beginning. So so, but like if you were in your first year and you're like, okay, you know, uh, Las Vegas in 28, what are we gonna do from, you know, 24 to 28? What what do those four years look like? That's crazy to me. Um, to to not know what that would look like. Uh, but you know, we're just taking it one day at a time. That's all I can do. I'm not here to get you in trouble, but has the owner been around? I've uh, never seen him, not once. So, I, I don't. Um, I think he was at the draft for a bit. I think. Uh, I'm not certain if that was from a different year. <laughs> I frankly, I don't know. I saw a picture, but it could have been. It could have been like a, uh, a meme or something. I, don't, I didn't really read the caption. Um, but no, I uh, I have not had uh, not not seen uh, not in the clubhouse anyway. Um, so, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Going back to your days in Minnesota, I know that that our buddy Trevor Plouffe has said that the poll ads were were visible, not in the way, but they were accessible if you needed them. Stevie Cohen, we know the deal in New York City. He's not always, but he is a prominent owner in this league. Do you think that it would help the team if the owner showed his face at this point, or is it just not a big deal? Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, I just don't think guys are really. I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's something that like the, the players at least are thinking about a lot anymore. It's, I think it's just kind of been moved past. Like this is just the way it is. Um, and to be honest, like it's not like every single other major league team has their owner around all the time. Right. There's, there's, there's some teams where it's actually kind of confusing who, who is the owner. So uh, <laughs> like, you know, you, you see people who are in the group, but they're different people all the time. Like you're like, Oh, that's one of them. So, like, it's not like it's, like, you know, only confusing here. Uh, so, it's just, like, yeah, is it nice to see? It's the same thing with, like, GMs and front, and presidents and front office. Like, being able to see them and, like, uh, shake their hand every once in a while and, like, get the feeling that if something, if the, if the sky was falling and you needed to, like, go up to the office and knock on the door and talk to them that, that that's that, that there's at least a level of com- uh, comfortability there to, to do that. Um, it does go a long way that that's, but is it absolutely necessary that like you're, you know, high five at them, you know, at the end of a win and all that stuff. Cause there's teams like that, that exists. Uh, is that completely necessary? No, I don't think so. Today's episode of the Chris Rose rotation presented by these guys over at shady rays. I want you to take on the sun this summer with gear that is built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades at a very affordable price. In fact, Shady Rays offers a world-class product just as good as any expensive pair ever worn. They're durable frames. They got extremely clear optics. You look great, by the way. And guess what? They're going to keep money in your pocket. The price is not insane. But what is, is that Shady Rays offers the best protection in the history of eyewear. 
Every pair of these bad boys is backed by lost and broken replacements. So what does that mean? If you lose or break a pair, even on day one of ownership, they're going to send you a brand new pair. You don't have to pick up the phone and give them some sob story about sitting on your shades in your car, about losing them in the ocean or anything else that could have happened. They'll just say, hey, Mr. Rose, we've got your address on file. We'll send them out immediately. Well, how much is it going to cost me? It's not going to cost you a thing. That's right. So that means you can wear your Shady Rays with confidence because they have your back all year long right after you purchase them. And exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays has given out their best deal of the season. All you have to do is head on over to ShadyRays.com, use the code word ROSE for 50% off two plus pair of polarized sunglasses. You might need an extra pair. Your buddy night might need one, somebody in your family. So you could always purchase two plus pair of polarized shades. And you're going to use the code word ROSE to save 50% off at ShadyRays.com. Believe me, you're going to look like a million bucks. You'll feel like a million bucks. You're not going to spend anything near a million bucks. Okay, last question about this, and then we'll move on. You are a cinematic buff. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're living out a real-life major league? It's got the it's got a little bit of those uh vibes. It's funny because I keep saying one of my favorite phrases to say literally every time a ball's in the air is it's it's too high. It's too high. <laughs> every time. I do it every <laughs> single time. So like it makes sense. Uh and but I, I use it in the context that it actually is too high and not a joke about it being hit, you know, for four sixty and saying it's too high. Uh but yeah, I it, it does. It's funny. It's like it is a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of parallels between the movie and uh, well, uh, all done. Yeah, we just got to go win the pennant. That's the only thing left okay. to do. Yeah, I can't imagine that there is a cardboard cutout of John Fisher in the locker There's room not. where you are peeling off a piece of clothing every time Confirm you get a that win. Just, yeah, that's not there. That's not there. Let's is get that. Anybody, Let's get that clear. Is anybody in the uh, in the cold tub? Or the hot tub pulling a a motor from a boat, you know we haven't reached that status. No, but fun fact, um, those whirlpools, like that's still what they look like, and it's still how they work. And if you watch them, because I watched the movie uh, uh, Forty Two or yeah Forty Two about Jackie Robinson, and the whirlpools in the background of that movie are exact like they're the same like that technology has not changed in a hundred years which is insane to me it's crazy it's still a tub that same size and there's like some sort of looks like a motor that that is moving the water via air and they're like it has not changed in a meaningful way in a hundred years which is everything else in baseball has changed so much but that doesn't there we go there's the photo it looks amazing that is pretty unreal that we haven't made leaps and bounds yet but dare to dream a little. Um, so probably the biggest game you guys had all year was the reverse boycott. What was the atmosphere like? It was it was electric in there. the The craziest thing they the the crazy thing is when they did the silence for a whole batter, mm -hmm. and the, then I mean they obviously started chanting after that. But the the fact that they were that organized was like that's impossible you i mean you've seen moments of silence for like you know uh uh you know following military service members or someone in the organization that passed away and there's still people like yelling like just like uh, around you can hear a couple people like yelling like not even realizing what's going on when that happened it was silent every single person in the entire stadium was silent that was uh it was a really interesting it was a really cool uh example of human ingenuity for sure for sure um but no it was it was a blast and to, to be honest <clears throat> saving that game was top three probably moments in the career for me for sure why well after how everything happens in the beginning of this year it was a big deal um i uh, there's some it was personal like in things that I'd been working on and I was trying to watch my own progress come back and get in a position where I could be successful and have confidence out on the mound. And I felt it that night, like I was, it was never in doubt for me, which is kind of crazy um, knowing what I knew, what, how I felt the month before that, but that was a big one. And then just like the atmosphere, what it meant 
to the team, what it meant for just how how the energy around everybody because it was winning. We won our seventh straight game too at that point, which up to that like that we doubled our wins. So like that was that was a big deal. We would really taken it, taken uppercut after gut punch all season and and to have a little bit of things go our way against the best record in the major leagues it just like to, it just made sense it was like of course this happened this is awesome let's get back to uh for people that may not know you spent a little time on the i believe it's called the ang- is it called the anxiety list now in baseball yeah. anxiety aisle or whatever you want to call it okay how did this first transpire for you? How do you approach a team when it's not a physical injury? Um, I'll be honest. I think I had, I already had had a couple um, of fairly honest conversations with the team in spring training. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily like I'm feeling anxious. Like it wasn't like identifying like I'm going through some things. Um, there was some stuff in the, at home and the, in the private life too, that was just kind of like piled and so, like, I'm like, I'm dealing with a large, uh, growing pile of things that are making me anxious, and you know, there there's stuff that I might need to go take care of, or whatever. Um, and they were very like open and receptive to that. I, I went through, you know, our training staff, and I had conversations with Katze, and, and like, and then uh, 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 David Forrest was on board. Like, so like, they all knew. Like, this had been mentioned. Um, and the support was there already. So that was a big deal. Yeah. And then there was just a night where, um, I, I was, I was really frustrated by how things had gone on the field, um, to where there was no way I could even like, I could pull apart any specific thing. It was like every single thing I looked at made me mad and I could not calm down. It took me, I, I, frankly, I stomped around the clubhouse, like just yelling. Like everyone was my, was who I was going to vent to every person I saw. So I was like, this is like different. I guess it's taking a long time and I'm very, very angry to the point where I was like, yeah, this is something that needs to be addressed. So that conversation happened again and we kind of worked through it as a group. Um, All those same people I talked to and, and I got some really great support and, you know, they, they were like, whatever you need to do, we fully support you. And once, once that happens, like you can, you can make the, take the, the action you need to take to, to just like figure it out. Because I'm like, if this keeps happening, like I'm not only am I going to be miserable, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to be able to do my job as well as I can anyway. So what's the point of like, you know, I don't want to be out there like being a liability when things are going the way they are for our team anyways. Like we don't need that on top of everything else. Um, so it was, it was, but at the end of the day, you got to take care of yourself. So, um, but fortunately I've, I've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years for things like this anyway. So it was already kind of front of mind. Were you scared? Yeah, a little bit. Um, scared, just it's frustration. It's just like, it's so frustrating to feel like you're a, you're like not in control of your own body. And especially when you look, look at like, look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I've been doing this for, this is my 10th season. Like why I've handled everything up to this point. And then it became apparent to me that I'm like, I didn't in- instantly handle everything up to this point. I had to work on everything. And, I, but eventually I got to a point where um, I, I could grow enough to, or I, I had growth in the area I need to get to, to where it's not an issue like it used to be anymore. And it's always been like that from, you know, working through Tommy John surgery you know, my a back issue in 2016, all physical injuries, but like the same approach, like you just build a plan and you execute that plan and you just keep working and working and working and however long it takes, however long it takes. And I had a little bit of a setback in the middle there um, because I don't think I quite hit where I needed to go or didn't quite have the strategies I needed to do it on a day-to-day basis. Um, but I think we got it. And uh, the work I've been doing since has unlocked, felt like it's unlocked me in those days where I'm like, Oh, like I had one yesterday. I was getting anxious yesterday and I don't know why. Um, but I, I put a bunch of stuff into my, put a bunch of my routine into, into play. And, um, a lot of it worked really, really well. And I got to a place where, where I could, where I felt better about, um, being ready to, to pitch that night. So that's just a testament to sometimes you just got to do a bunch of work that is harder than other stuff you've 
like sometimes it's something that you've never had to deal with before. You got to come up with a whole new plan, but I take pride in my ability to do that. So great. I applaud you. Did you, did you contemplate quitting? Uh, that's always in there because um, sometimes, especially if, you know, for those of you out there who have had therapy before, it's like a lot of times, sometimes the, uh, the solution is to remove yourself from the environment you're in. Um, and that is always an option. Um, it's not the ideal option. There are consequences to that that I wasn't willing to, to um, accept. And at the end of the day, like, yeah, I'm like, is this, is this like, is this what I need to do? Because I'm, I'm really not enjoying how I feel all the time. And basically I was able to very vividly see how much, like the moment I got into a plane to go home, for example, regret would have hit me immediately. I knew it. I just, I felt it already. I'm like, I'm already starting to regret it. I've made that decision. So that tells me that's not it. I got stuff to do. And uh, I realized that since I was 18 years old, that I had a vision of walking off a mound for the first last time and knowing that that was it. Um, and that was very important to me. And then you just throw on top of that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to abandon my, this team, these, these guys, like, what is that? What is that show? Like, Hey guys, it's tough. And I know you guys are all having a tough time too, but I'm just going to give up. <laughs> like that's not, it just sent the wrong message to them. And that's, I took, I wanted to help these guys establish themselves in the big leagues. And that was probably the worst message that I could say, send on my way out. So I'll, all signs pointed to, yeah, you're not doing that. Um, and it was pretty easy after that to to then refocus on on getting getting better. And once that was removed as an option in my head, um, I think I immediately that's when I started to to kind of heal and figure it out. Good. We appreciate you sharing that. I know that's been a lot. Um we wanted to give you your space here, you know, and but I think it's really important for people that are listening to hear this that a guy who is at the top zero 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 one percent in the world at your profession struggles just like everybody else it ain't easy yeah. man it isn't it's all relative just remember that like not only remember you got stuff going on and then don't forget that the, the person you just walked by on the street they probably got stuff going on so yeah. um it's just it's take care of yourself and uh, do what you need to do and when it comes down to it it's always just like a consequence versus decision thing if you if you want to make a decision and you're willing to deal with the consequences of that decision then you can make that decision um but as long as you're approaching things that way um it makes it much much easier to kind of move past that decision making process and then actually start healing so if i could leave you with one piece of advice it'd be that for sure the last uh six weeks on the field for the a's have been much better um you guys have resembled a baseball team where the early part of the season was a rough watch. The reality is, is that you're the highest paid player on the team and you're mm -hmm. probably going to be on the move in the next couple of weeks. How do you deal with that? Um, actually, to be honest, this, this, this is pretty much easier to um, kind of project and like think about because I, it, it was, I knew that going into spring that like I'm on a one-year deal um, I, at that point I was the highest paid player at the, uh, and I didn't know if they were going to sign somebody else, but I was going to be in the top echelon and I'm a relief. So like relievers go all over, like they, they switch teams like crazy over the deadline. They're usually lower prospect asks because the pay, uh, my, my, in terms of like the, the greater scope of a, uh, of a affordable like payroll, like even though I'm the highest paid player on this team, it's still not like a huge chunk out of a, out of a payroll for, any other team in the league. So like I'm fairly affordable. I'm on a one-year deal. Uh, I wouldn't, in terms of a trade or whatever, it wouldn't cost that much probably in players. So like it just, and then, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, where we are in the standings and stuff. Just kind of, so like, it's just something like if it happens, duh, if it doesn't, then I, 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 I'm, I get to continue to work with these guys and continue to like, for example, work with Shea. I'm really enjoying work with Shea watching him grow into a, into a big league starting catcher um, in terms of pitch calling and stuff. Like I'm, we have awesome conversations that I really, really enjoy those. So like, that's the work, like, Oh, okay. It doesn't happen. Then I get to do that for the rest of the year. Like, so it's kind of a, we can handle it no matter what happens. 
Um, whatever the team needs to do, I fully support. And, and if it does end up happening, I hope they get a you know, I hope there's a kid, even if it's a player to be named later, he's a low A kid, and then in three years he's a stud. And I'd be like, I helped with that. <laughs> that'd be awesome. I'd love that. I don't think many guys would say that. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. You know what? There's no reason to root against it. Although in yeah. you know, then in four years, the other teams look at it and be like, you know, we got two months of Trevor May and we gave up a kid that's an all star. What the hell were we thinking? God damn it. Happens. Uh, it's baseball's hard. <laughs> Baseball is hard. Hang with them. That's what we're we're told. Don't like it. Don't like it. Play better. Don't like it. Make better decisions. That's all I'm saying. More Trevor May coming your way on the Chris Rose rotation, but very quickly, raise your hand if you're a dog lover out there. That's right. I'm raising my hand because we have had our adorable Sydney for closing in on a decade. She's gotten a little older, but we still want to treat her with the love and respect that we did ever since she set foot or paw day one into our household. And how have we been able to do that over the last six months? Thanks to our friends over at the Farmer's Dog. That's the way you want to treat your pooch, whether they're a brand new puppy or an aging veteran. They'll give you more quality years with your dog. The Farmer's Dog makes and delivers fresh, healthy dog food. It is recommended by vets, nutritionally balanced, and made from human-grade ingredients in safe, clean kitchens. That traditional wet and dry dog food, guess what? It's extremely processed. It uses much lower quality ingredients than they claim to, and they're tough to portion, right? You kind of spoon it out, and you're like, is this right for my dog? Well, let me tell you what Farmer's Dog does. They create the healthy food with those fresh ingredients and they portion it out perfectly. They send it to you in these frozen packets. You throw it in the freezer. When you know that you need one a couple days from now, you put it in the fridge so it thaws out. And then you, we give Sydney a quarter of the pouch every time out. It's easy for us. We don't have to sit there and do any of the guesswork because you fill out a questionnaire online. You tell them what sort of breed of dog you have, how old it is, how much activity it gets. And then they, voila, send you the food. And it actually says Sydney on the package so they really care about your dog so once again doesn't matter if your dog is old or young it's always the right time to begin investing in their health get 50 percent off your first box at the farmers dog.com slash john boy today they will say row, row, row. i guarantee it in a 60 yard dash which for people that don't know that's like the baseball measurement when you're at all these you know showcase events and stuff you always have to do a sit you had to run a 60 back in the day didn't you yeah yeah how was it by the way back in the day slow so slow spark Everybody testing is what we called it back then i believe that uh spark was owned by nike i believe the spark brand has been flipped about 17 times since then so they still do testing like this but it's called some it's been like 19 different names uh it's still the same company but we used to like run with a parachute and like do the vertical jump and uh, the grip test and all that kind of stuff, which is all the same testing we still do. It just doesn't have the Spark logo on it anymore. Okay, so in a 60, how much of a head start would we have to give you against Estery Ruiz in order to make it a photo finish? 60. I would have to have, I think at least, probably between 10 and 15 yards. Like he's that much faster than me, and that, and it also depends on how quickly quick the quick they are off the block, right? So if we went like forty yards, like with Buxton, for example, mm -hmm. he's fast, but he's not as quick with his first step as he's fast with his first step. So like, uh, the shorter the distance, I would be be have a better chance with Buck, but like with Esty, it doesn't matter. He gets to full speed too fast, so I need a bigger, much bigger uh, lead to stay ahead of him. There's just because uh, I'm really slow off the blocks. I can get up to speed at like a slightly below average speed, but like I'm really slow off the block. So that's the kind of stuff I make. I, I pay attention to like Billy Hamilton and Byron Buxton, both very fast, very different runners. Um, Which pitcher would do the best against him on your team? Is there a good which pitcher? pitching athlete? Um, I'm trying to think it's pro it's usually always a starter. But like I'm trying to think we do not have many we do not have we don't have that guy like standing backflip pitcher guy right uh, like we don't have a joe kelly so 
Okay, uh, okay so it, how about all time that you've played with, whether it's in New York, Minnesota, here, or Philly minor leagues, where you're like, that, yeah, Joe Kelly's a freak athlete for people that don't know. He's ridiculous. Um, One very, very fast runner, Josh Reneke, extremely fast. Uh, there's, a no, there's a name for you. Um, yeah. X Rockies great, Josh Reneke. Uh, he could do a standing backflip and cleats. He he was a wide receiver though, college. So that makes sense. Oh, okay. Um, Jake Diekman is a freak, freak athlete. Really, that guy can jump out of a gym. Oh, uh, I don't know if this is speed, but uh, another guy who people would never think can can absolutely can can like go between his legs and dunk is uh, Caleb Thielbar. That guy. What? Yeah, just it's incredible. He can he can the move a little bit. The twins guy, the twins guy, yeah, the twins guy. He he can move. Um, God, man, who else? Uh, I'm trying to think like a Mets. I mean, no, we were all slow with the Mets, so slow. Like I'm not gonna I'm gonna throw an Aaron Loop at you. No, he's not. <laughs> he's not. He's not winning races. I would say I would say probably Renicky's probably the fastest. Um, and then I wouldn't count Jake Diekman out of anything. But uh, yeah, no, I've I've played with a lot of not very fast pitchers. Yeah, not Mike Pelfrey. Uh, it ain't not Mike Pelfrey. <laughs> um, I know that when we started this relationship very early on, we showed some video of you hitting. We saw something know. on social media of you. I think it was you, your wife, and maybe your mother-in-law ta- watching video of you hitting. No, they were. That was them watching that live. They were what? watching the game live because it was my first time hitting in the big league, so they made sure they watched the game. And the Kate was taking a video of my AV and. Then they just, I just, we got that gold commentary in the background, like, oh, he's not good at this. And then my wife's like, it's really not. And she goes, he must have hit in high school. I did until I was a pitcher only as my senior year. I used to lay on the couch during BP. Dude, so we're seeing this video of you in St. Louis where I don't know if that's Yachty or somebody else, but they're lined up probably 10 inches off of the plate. It's Yachty. It's Yachty. And it was John Lackey. Oh, it was the mouth. Yeah, breathing. but little do you know that it was pitch nine, and it had been 0-2 the whole time, and I had fouled off eight straight fastballs into their dugout. Not one was pulled. It was all like late, 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 late. <laughs> and he was, you know, John. He was just full, full bulldog, stomping around the mound, like looking me in the eyes, like mother effing me. He really, really was. He was pissed because I would not miss a fastball. And then he just threw a curveball down the middle, and I swung at it like it was the best breaking ball anyone's ever thrown. And then I remember I pitched against him. I threw a first pitch fastball up. He fouled it back and they just looked at me. I was like, are we doing this? <laughs> Bro, you saw me hit. Like what? This is not a, we, we're not in a WWE match. I'm not like, we're not seeing who's the best hitter. We both are terrible. It's okay. Let's just, you know, I was just like, I don't know why he's so upset right now. Maybe it's because I made him throw 10 pitches. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and with Lackey, yeah, you know, I got to know him a little bit after his or later like in his that. career because he, yeah, he and Millar live on the same street in Austin, Texas. Oh yeah, and he is the biggest red ass you'll ever meet. I saw him one time. First Doesn't, pitch of the by, game. Doesn't yeah. Arietta and uh, Arietta and like Tommy Hunter, all those guys live down there. Yeah, um, it's like Buckholz. in the same neighborhood. And Buckholz. yeah, Buckholz lives next door to Millar. Lackey's like five houses down. Now, Millar's looks like the little starter house. He lives in a beautiful place. But compared to like Lackey, I mean, his pool puts like the wind pool to shame. That's so Vegas. funny. They, they just put a major league clubhouse like in a neighborhood in Texas. That's essentially what they did. Anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. No, no, no. So I was just saying that Lackey one time, you know how he used to, I mean, bitch at the umpires every start. It was the first pitch of the game, and he was bitching. First pitch of the game. You got to have some balls to do that. You do. Uh, I've seen some pretty funny ones. Josh Willingham once did this in the minor leagues. Uh, first pitch of the game, called a strike. He's like, come on, both ways. Like, stepped out and just screamed at a minor league umpire. Scared the crap, crap out of him. That was pretty funny. Uh, but my favorite John Lackey story, and I wasn't there, but you'll if you remember this, uh, he was with the Red Sox. It's a playoff game. And uh, I, I believe I believe it's Tito coming out to get him, and he's coming out to get him, and he's like, "No, 
no, I'm not coming out of this oh. game. He goes, this is my guy. You can see him. This is my guy. I got this. This is my guy. Guy comes up. He walks him on four pitches. <laughs> he gets the ball yeah. back. And he sees Cheeto come back out. And he's like, fuck. And I just, I think that was the funniest, like, because he was so convicted, just like sprayed four balls. and like, damn it. That didn't go the way I thought it would go. I'm like, that is quintessential John Lackey. I loved it. I loved it so much. I mean, I wish he would have, you know, obviously got the guy, but like just the, just the just the whole change in his in his demeanor is just classic because he just shows everything on the face. No, that was his. Uh, that was actually back in the Angel days. So that was when social was it Angels to get him. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Been re- he's been on a lot of red teams. So yes, he. Uh, so you you never Cardinals, know. Yeah, Red Sox, Angels. Yes, he's been there. Um, so you uh you had the All Star game in your the town where you live now in Seattle, and. You got to do a little bit of the media stuff. Give us yeah. the synopsis. How much fun was it? I had an absolute blast. Like, uh, um, it's funny. I think Jenny mentioned the second day. She's like, "All right, that's an hour long, oh, only an hour more." And I'm like, "Only an hour? I like, I don't want it to end." And they're like, they looked at me like, "You want to stand here longer?" <laughs> and I was just having a really good time learning, learning about it. Um, I, I did freeze up the first couple interviews like of course we got Garrett Cole out the gate and I just like uh, like the game it came around to me and the and I just like froze I like paused for like three seconds I'm like oh god you're blowing it um and then we got Whit Merrifield and I kind of stumbled over that one and then after that we're good uh but they were all awesome like uh uh Bowden Bowden and uh um and Farron were great, and they, like, both, like, said, hey, you know, just have, like, these three questions on deck. Because I'm used to answering, not, like, asking. Right. Um, and then I kind of leaned into my being still a player, and uh, I noticed – I know, like, all these little things about all these guys, like, things that they're into or, like, things, weird little quirks they do on the mound that I noticed. That like, other people were like, oh, they do that? I'm like, oh, this is my lane. I can do that. So once I leaned into that, it was smooth sailing, and I loved it. I thought every interview was just too short. Um, I wanted like, for example, Strider, I just wanted, I wanted to like lob him like super nerd pitching definitions to break down for the people, but we just didn't have the time. Like I tried to get him to, to explain, um, uh, uh, team shifted wake to the people at home because I know all about it. I know he knows all about it and he was going to answer it. And I was like, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I stole your slider grip. That's what I told him. (laughs) So like that type of stuff. Like I wanted, I wanted like, I'm like, I wish this was an hour podcast and not a two minute, uh, uh, two minute interview, but it was so fun. Um, learned all the ins and outs, uh, how to listen to your producer, how to not put the, put the mic down when you talk to somebody like, uh, it was, it was, I, I'm so happy they invited me. It was, it was great. That was good. Who was the, uh, who was the player that you interviewed that you really knew nothing about that you walked away and were impressed with? Um, uh, Pablo Lopez. So I didn't know personality wise, um, how he was, like, if he was quiet, because he seems like he might be quiet, like just kind of a quiet, kind of like super laid back. He was so excited. Um, and then you could just tell pitching. I would have such a good time sitting there. He's talking about him and how him and Sonny Gray sit there and just talk about pitch design and blah, 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 blah. Um, and Sonny got into how he throws his cutter. And I was like, because he's such a sinker guy. And so I, I, and he's like, I'm supinated. And I'm like, I want to, they're like, Hey, ask him about, cause he, I'm like, do you throw your sinker with super, um, seam shifted wake to get it to go that way? Even though it's like the cut spring, cause that's kind of what my changeup does now. So I'm like, I wanted to ask him about that. We ran out of time. So those two guys talking about pitching, I just imagined it. And then Pete Mackey's the pitching coach there. So I'm like, I'm matching Pete there. I'm like, Oh, I would love to sit and talk pitching with these guys. So, uh, when guys got really excited about the question you asked them, uh, that got me pumped. And again, I was like, God, I just need to have a podcast where you guys come on and we just talk about it. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, pitching into, I'm not trying to steal your idea, but <laughs> I kind of want to do that. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. I know that you guys really nerd out with stuff like that. So that's fun. Oh yeah. Love that's it. Fun. I'm getting to know. And then we saw all the photographs. So are you turning into an, uh, the next Randy Johnson? So the photographs, um, I the camera I have was just perfect for that. Uh, I was able to pick up like a Leica, which I didn't know anything about like two months ago. And a friend of mine who's a professional photographer is like, hey, I'm getting rid of mine because I got the new one. So I'm like, 
can I get a discount? And I think it was just a situation where I was like, I, I gotta, I don't really have a reason because it doesn't really do video that well. Uh, but I don't really have a reason to have this, but it's just, it's, I might want it. And then I got into it. I took a photography class online from a guy who just happens to have that same camera. And I was like, I'm going to go get some really cool photos of the game. So what would happen was they would walk up and I was always third in the rotation of asking the question. So I'd take a step back, get a picture, get a picture of like Jenny asked the first one or, or uh, Duquette asked in the second one real quick, just trying to get one of them because I wanted to give those to them too. And then, uh, and then I just stepped back in, put it down, step back in and went. Uh, but mostly, mostly the pictures I'm taking are, are to inform possible filming later. So like you can get a snap of photo of something that could be a, an angle or a scene or something. And then you can imagine what it would be like if it were a video. So like, that's kind of why I, I take that camera everywhere just to snap pictures of everything. Just like I see a cool, like, tree line street or something i'll take a picture straight down it um things like that so it just kind of all coalesced in there and then then i saw pete standing like by himself he was just about to come out the field and like pete and he just turned and he just didn't know who i was at first the camera i'm like it's me and then boom don't move and hit him with a couple and then i said <laughs> him to him he's like dude this is sick so the cool thing about the camera is you don't have to do anything it's all like the automated focus and everything oh. is so good that you just like tap it it goes into focus boom and it's perfect like almost every single time. So it's really great for things like that where you're just quickly trying to get stuff because they always look good. Alonzo gave you the presidential thumbs up, by the way. He, he, re- he, I could tell he was like, like, <laughs> what do I do? I, he was in, he was like on the baseline because we were all being pushed off the field. So there's no one around him. And he's like, like, so I was like, I mean, it's for you, bro. And Mets fans, they loved it. They loved it. I see saw him and posted it on socials. All right, I got two more things, and we got to send you to the yard. I know you got an afternoon game. Um, yep. Speaking of the Mets, and I know it's no longer your team, but they basically got booed off the field last night. How different is New York than any other place? Like, how tough is it? Nobody's going to feel bad for the Mets. They've got the highest payroll yep. in the game. They've got, in some cases, Hall future Hall of Famers. In other cases, really good all-star type players all over the field, so nobody's going to feel bad for them. But how tough is it when things are going shitty there? What are those guys going through? It's 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 tough. Um, and I think that I think that like you know I think that everyone involved, fans, bro, everyone knows, everyone knows that it's more tough there. They, it's very very, you know, it's not like it's a secret. Um, I think that it's one of those things like if you need to get going. Uh, it's just so much easier to put lots more pressure on you yourself to get out of a slump. So I just think that like, it's just, that's the hard thing. Some guys just get in that hole and never get out of it because it's not something, it's just not a place you go learn to do that. You know, if you've never had to really do it that way, deal with that outside kind of pressure um, attached to the noise and things um, because you just want to avoid, you want, you want people to like you. At the end of the day, people just like it when people like you and you feel like no one likes you. It's just harder to do the thing uh, with confidence. Uh, but, you know, those guys are pros. I I know I know every single guy individually, you know, the Max, the Scherzers, the Verlanders, the Lindors, the Lances, the McNeils, like they're pros, right? They can they, they will all find a way to get the, get clicking, you know, in their own game. It's just whether or not it's all at the same time. And that just has not coalesced. It just hasn't. They just haven't done it all at the same time. They've all had good stretches in, in the year and it just hasn't lined up with anyone else. And sometimes that's all a season like this is, is like, yeah, they're, some guys are playing just about like they usually do, but it's just when. And uh, and then you have an injury here or there and it sucks. But yeah, I feel I feel for those guys just from a human level, like it's it's even harder to to not put all this pressure and stay kind of even keel um, there than it is in other places. And that's just the way it is. Okay. Let's get, let's end it back to your team. Uh, you did have a lone all-star in Brent Rooker, who's been a phenomenal story. Guy was a high pick, I believe by the twins has bounced around to several organizations and this year put it all together and had a chance to play in the all-star game. Uh, here is Mark Kotze uh, telling your team, this dude's your all-star. If you've made a major league all-star team, keep your head in the air. I did not put my head up. Keep your head in the air. (laughs) 
really a, a cool moment. And he, he gave you guys a little speech uh, talking about perseverance and having to learn how to believe in himself at this level. I imagine that that was one of those real human moments that you guys go through during a long season. It really, really was. And uh, I know this isn't about me, but he did mention me in the speech, which was very nice of him. Um, he used me as an example of some of the guys. Because because to be honest, I have played with Rook before. He is, I believe he's a triple crown winner in the SEC or in the, uh, in, in the he, his senior or his junior year. He was a tri- like the best overall hitter in the nation by like far. So um, I believe maybe it's SEC. Uh, it might be the whole country. I don't know. But he was, you know, that good. And you could see, you can see when you watch him, you're like, this guy, this guy's naturally uh, like a really good hit. Um, there are. He's got a pretty swing. And so, but I, and after getting to know him personally, like I saw a lot of like, there's a, you know, we get imposter syndrome. Sometimes we get a little bit of like, am I like, I believe that I am good enough, but I haven't shown it. Am I just out of my mind? Like, is that real? Because uh, there's no proof yet. And um, it's very hard to stay confident when you haven't seen proof. So in order for him to go on that run, he did. And to get voted in by like players and coaches as the second best DH behind Otani. That was, I think that was like, when he heard that, he was like, whoa, like people are noticing. And that helped him internalize the fact that he's done well. So yes, it was a very human moment. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so happy for him. Proud of him. I predicted a home run. Ground with double is fine, I guess. So, uh, he, he, he represented us well. Uh, he, you know, he looked great in the uni, dialed up on the, uh, on the red carpet, like did everything. He represented the, the Oakland A's really, really well. And um, I think that he, no one deserves it more than him. I think that he's got a lot, lot still, to, a lot of, a lot of improvement still to go, but I think that he's well on his way to becoming a, a, a consistent force in the league for sure. I promised you I'd get you out of here within 45 minutes because you've got a, game against Trevor Plouffe's Minnesota Twins. Do you see him down at the field when he's broadcasting? I I didn't see him yesterday, but I'll be honest. We were we were on the field for a long time yesterday. And I <laughs> got inside as quickly as Actually, I'm fairly certain actually we were there. We got off the field before the, they even got there. So like I ha- wouldn't have seen him yet, but I'm sure he'll be I'm sure he'll be back there around uh, uh, the the turtle during BP or something today because he just can't help it. Yeah. I will give you five bucks if you mess up his hair. Oh, he better not be wearing Vans and tube socks with shorts. Of course oh, he's going, going to be. Say. Of course he will. Like live. Yes. Is he, he? Is he doing? Is he in the booth? He wasn't last night. Or I does don't he understand. Do the on it. the field like. Yeah, down. so what? I mean, they're like, we have to do the interview in case there's a win. Then go do the first eight innings, and if they're leading, then go downstairs. Believe me, there's not going to be a stampede down to the field. You'll be just fine. So, like, he's really good and smart, and he and Morneau actually play well off of one another. Just let him in the freaking booth the whole game. Let's go. Well, in fact, the two-thirds of their booth is guys I played with. And I got assistant GMs everywhere now, and there's just it's getting crazy. It's getting crazy. I, I, the fact that I'm 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 seeing more people that are in like a management or a media <laughs> uh, uh, job than the players at this point. This uh, that's kind of how it happens. They all told me it would happen that way. I didn't believe them, but now I do. Okay, all right. Time for you to get going. Always appreciate you catching up. This was a lot of fun. It was great to see you in person. Uh, last week up in Seattle as well. Continued success, whether that is in Oakland or elsewhere the next time we talk to you, but uh, keep smiling. And thank you so much for sharing a lot of that. I think it any bit we can help with people as they're going through whatever they're going through is really important. So we, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I pre- I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because I, I, I've been meaning to kind of go there a little bit more and share um but uh you made it very very easy on me and that was that was very nice so i appreciate it you got it brother you got it uh for our one-of-a-kind producer who's uber talented robbie Shiraco, our outstanding summer intern alden stone and trevor may of the oakland athletics i am chris rose we will see you next time here on the chris rose rotation a production of john boy media